as Mark just mentioned, we're going to dive into some of the results of our channel characteristic or channel uh, gross channel metric uh, research. Previous research regarding forest, we off? No, you just are really quiet. <laughs> I can be very loud. You want me to stand right in this microphone? Uh, previous research regarding the effects of forestry practice on headwater channel characteristics has been predominantly retrospective. Uh, the few examples uh, that we do have of um, experimental studies with alternative buffers here, um, the CISL study, which was a, a BLM density management study in Oregon, uh, the O'Connell and others study, that old timber fish and wildlife study that took place in this area. Uh, those first two studies did not include uh, complete harvest all the way to the stream edge. Uh, so that's an important distinction to make between those studies and this one. And then the Jackson study that we've referred to throughout the day, um, it's important to remember that slash following harvest uh, buried almost the entirety of the, the clear cut reaches and that resulted in an exclusion of their most severe treatment uh, from their analysis. And so our objective here is to evaluate the response of channel characteristics, uh, the dominant substrates, and then channel units with our varying buffer treatments, um, which are depicted here again. You guys are probably all very familiar with uh, the arrangement of our treatments now from left to right reference to our, our 0%. The same two questions that I posed this morning to, to frame the results when I was talking about wood loading. Um, was there a harvest re response? Was there an increase or a decrease in all of the treatments relative to the reference? And then was there a treatment response? What, did one or more of the treatments respond differently uh, than other treatments or reference? The metrics here uh, for assessing the, the gross channel characteristics or, or the dimensions basically were the wetted and bankful width and depth. And then for substrates, we assessed the, the dominant substrates um, in terms of three groupings, the fines and sand. Uh, our moderate sized substrates were gravel and cobble and then our largest substrates, uh, boulder and bedrock. And we classified our streams according to the four channel unit types in the table here. And so for each of those channel unit types, we, we could assess the overall density of those units, uh, different measures of the size of those units, essentially. And then depending on the unit type, we had some additional measures. So in the case of steps, uh, we evaluated the, the proportion of the total channel rise that could be attributed to steps. Uh, and then we look a little bit at the overall distribution of those channel units in relation to each other. Uh, I'm definitely not going to address all of the metrics on this particular page. There's um, just not very much time and I am gonna focus in on uh, where there were more significant results and really where there's a, a story to tell. So again, our primary sampling strategy for this component involved 10 meter sample intervals along our main stem channel and a systematic sampling uh, so we always sample the bottom 200 meters uh, and then a subset of our moderate or large size basin. So um, the bigger the basin, the um, smaller the proportion of the total length that we sampled. This component also involved two years pre and two years post harvest. And I would also like to point out that the 10 meter sample intervals were essentially the same during all of the years. Again, after harvest, we did experience pretty heavy wood loading in some areas. And as I mentioned this morning, we developed a new sampling method, which was simply a three meter excavation plot that we conducted at some of our sites. Um, and those, the number of plots was dependent on the proportion of the total sample length that was obstructed or the uh, proportion of the total network that was approximately 70% or greater in total wood cover. I showed this table this morning as well. As buffer treatment, uh, as buffer length decreases, the proportion of the target sample with that high wood cover uh, increased more or less in linear fashion. And uh, along with that, the number of excavation plots also increased. So 
so we measured uh, the dominant substrate and the two channel, uh, the bankful and the wetted width and the depth as point measures at the start of each of our 10 meter sample intervals. And then our, our channel unit classification was uh, a continuous uh, classification. We, we classified the entire length as one of the four unit types and then I took some additional measures depending on the specific unit type. In this case, the, our surveys in those obstruction pots were really simple and were limited to an assessment of what the most dominant um, channel unit type was. And that's because the simple act of extracting all of that material really impacted uh, some of the dimensions of the stream and upset the substrates in a way that we couldn't um, conduct the rest of those measures in those obstructed plots. So we have a single slide later to talk about how the channel unit distribution compared in the obstructed and unobstructed reaches, but the bulk of our analysis here is uh, focused on only those unobstructed uh, portions of our sites. Again, we calculated an average value for each metric by site and ear, the same null hypothesis and the same uh, generalized linear mixed effects model, and we're really focused here today on uh, that period by treatment effect. And our predetermined alpha value of 0.1. So when we did see a significant P, uh, treat period by treatment effect, when that p-value was less than or equal to 0.1, then we compare each of those treatments to the reference and to each other for those metrics. So our first result here, the stream wetted and bank full width, where we did uh, see some pretty significant results in the 0% treatment. So for wetted width, uh, we estimated an increase uh, post-harvest in all of our treatments and the reference, but that increase was less in the 0% sites. So um, essentially the, the wetted widths were constrained in that, uh, in that treatment. Bankful width uh, estimates actually decreased in the 0% and increased uh, elsewhere. And so those differences amount to uh, the bankful width was less than the, the other treatments and the reference by uh, 0.4 to 0.5 meters. The dominant substrates, uh, we did not get a significant period by treatment effect, but we did get, uh, for the most part, a linear response here. And so as buffer uh, length decreased, we saw an increase in the proportion of our intervals where fines and sand, our smallest substrate sizes were dominant. So we're talking about an increase in four, nine, and 16% of our sample intervals uh, as buffer decreases. And then the mirror image of that is the decrease in more or less linear fashion for the, the next largest substrate size, the gravel and cobble. We estimated an increase in average pool length for all of the treatments relative to the reference. A decrease in the proportion of the channel rise that was attributed to steps in the 0% treatment. I increase everywhere else. Then our more qualitative comparison here, we're looking at the proportion of our sample plots that were by dominant unit type that were in our unobstructed and, un and obstructed reaches uh, just during the post-harvest period since that's the only time we, we did our excavation plots. So the first thing you'll probably see here is that riffles were by far uh, the most common channel unit type by length. And you also see here that in the, un the obstructed reaches, uh, the prevalence of, of riffles was much less while cascades, pools, and steps were all more common in those obstructed reaches. And so to summarize, uh, we did see an increase in average pool length in all of our treatments relative to the reference. So what we're calling here is a harvest effect. Our treatment effects were really uh, focused in on the 0% treatment. And that's where we saw constrained wetted widths, uh, decreased bankful widths, and a decrease in the proportion of the channel rise that was attributed to those steps. The trends were that as buffer length decreases, sands and find, sands or fines and sand increase and gravel and cobble decreases. 
We have several discussion slides here. Um, first, we want to point out that there was what appears to be a year effect for so, uh, several of our, our metrics. And by year effect, we're talking about an increase all across the board, all, all of the treatments as well as the reference. That was the case for the frequency of cascades, average stream depth, and the average pool maximum depth. We're speculating that that may very well have been a result of increased precipitation that we did see during the three month period where these particular surveys were being conducted. This graph groups together the site, all the sites that were within four kilometers of each other, which is the resolution of the PRISM climate data that we drew this from. And you can see all across the board, uh, there was an increase in precipitation and it's not hard to imagine how those particular metrics might have been influenced in particular by an increase in precipitation. But it's really good to keep that in mind, I think, for all of our results here. We are very familiar with the challenges that are inherent in channel unit classification. At least a couple studies that have documented increased um, or that there is variability between observers. Those same studies um, pointed out that you can decrease sampler variability with increased training. And uh, we did take that message to heart and we provided quite a bit of training for our crews, not only at the beginning of each season, um, but we calibrated throughout the season. We always worked in pairs and switched up our teams a lot. And all of that was in an effort to, um, you know, have multiple sets of eyes. Uh, making these decisions and we feel pretty good about our ability to uh, decrease variability across samplers. We also had a, a fair bit of um, carryover from one year to the next. We, it seems like we almost always had a few crew members who were there for multiple years. That was really helpful for a lot of our surveys and um, with regards to standardization. Again, just a reminder, this analysis was limited to unobstructed areas. But we do want to point out that even in the absence of our buffer, our most extreme treatment, we were still able to conduct these particular surveys in um, nearly three quarters of our targeted sample length. Then my last slide here, I wanted to try to pull together two of the topics that I've presented on today and speak just a little bit to um, the, this contribution of wood to changes in channel characteristics. And so a lot of these re results came together, uh, in this case, in our 0% treatment, which is where we not only saw the highest uh, coverage over our streams of new wood following harvest, uh, by far our greatest increase in small woody debris uh, pieces was, was seen in the 0% as well. Wetted width was constrained, a bankful width was decreased. It seems pretty plausible that and we wouldn't be the first people to, to identify wood as, a, as an agent for constraining channel widths, despite the increase in precipitation. In a lot of ways, that increase in precipitation really makes those results in the 0% treatment uh, stand out even more. And then it does appear that we are seeing an increase in fines and sand in our 0% treatment. Another uh, reasonable hypothesis here, I think, is that we're seeing a little bit of infilling in our streams and in the form of fines and sand coming in from our banks that would, could very well be uh, responsible for those constrained or decreased uh, channel widths. That's all I have. Thank you.